Good evening. Good evening. Good Welcome to episode three of uh, Learn Live UAE. Really, really excited um, to be here again this evening, Mark, with yourself and some fantastic guests that we've got lined up. Um, what are you most looking forward to hearing about, Mark, tonight? Uh, well, I'm really looking forward to hearing not only uh, about some of the great tools that are out there, but how uh, the use of these types of technologies. And it was really interesting to learn um, recently about the term XR. I've tried to allude to it a little bit in my tweets in, in the run up to this evening, but uh, there are so many different sort of different acronyms to refer to these kinds of technologies, AR, MR, VR. Where I live, it's more UR, to be fair. But um, the, the, term, <laughs> the term XR um, is, is one which is sort of all encapsulating for these sorts of uh, virtual um, sort of uh, realities uh, that you can engage in in the classroom. So I'm really interested in, uh, to find out uh, more about what's out there, uh, what's actually affordable, because lots of schools think uh, this, these sorts of technologies are sort of out of their reach. Uh, so finding more about that. But also, uh, the ways in which you know, science fiction turning into science facts is, 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 is something which has impacted on us massively over the years. I mean, I always share about when I was a, a child, I used to watch things like Star Trek Next Generation. And I'd see like, you know, different people walking around with these things in their hands, these flat like tablet devices and thinking, you know, it was only at a Sinclair Spectrum at the time, you know, I had to put a cassette in and five hours later my game would have loaded. You know, I thought never in my lifetime will I have access to these kinds of technologies. And yet here we are now. I mean, the iPad's, you know, 10, more, more than 10 years old now. It's just amazing mm. the times that we live in. And so I'm really pleased to um, welcome our guests on this evening. We've got um, uh, Mr. Erdogan Edgy, as Leventa teacher from uh, um, uh, who, who teaches in Hong Kong. We've got Steve Bambury, uh, based out of Dubai, Iran in Logan, who's an AR developer. Uh, I'm really keen to find out more uh, myself, um, being a bit selfish, but learning more about the technologies that are there mm. and, and looking at what's going to be coming in the future. Obviously, with things like uh, uh, Moore's Law and, and, and um, you know, technology costs coming down all the time, how is that going to impact? When are we going to see these sorts of technologies at scale? Uh, inside schools, these kind of things, um, and, and hopefully, um, you know, I'll, I'll guess you know, bring some of those answers to us. What, what, what about yourself, Ollie? What are you, what are you looking forward to? Yeah, like you, really. I just sort of echo what you said. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from our first guest to hear what he's doing, sort of pushing the boundaries in his classroom. Um, I think it's probably right we ask him about his April Fools as well. Um, so, looking forward to hearing what Levent has got to say about that. So, I'm really looking forward to how he's applying these XR technologies to his classroom and the outcomes that he's he's managing to generate for his kids. Um, I'm also looking forward to, um, like yourself, hearing where technology like this is going to go in the next couple of years from um, Steve and from Arani. So I think it's going to be a really, really rich, rewarding show. Unlike you, though, I wasn't a Trekkie. I was actually a Battlestar Galactica fan. Um, but still, sci-fi, you know, it's right up both of our streets. So love it. Really looking forward to hearing what I've got to say. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I was talking uh, recently about uh, a program I've seen on on uh, Amazon Prime called Upload, um, and, and lots of these kind of. And Ready Player One is a film which um, you know I, I know that a lot of us are are, uh, um, are big fans of, and certainly uh, influences thinking about the, the short term future with these sorts of things as well. But uh, I just want to do a quick shout out and say thank you whilst we're um, talking, uh, talk to camera, talking to the audience as well. Uh, thank you so much for all of the support we've had with the guests. Uh, and with the people coming in and watching us, we, we are uh, our subscriber uh, count is going up. We're looking forward to uh, hitting the magic hundred. We want to try and get a vanity link. It's a bit like that Peter K thing with uh, Mum wants a new bungalow. We we want a vanity link. So uh, get the subscriptions coming in, please, folks, uh, so that we can we can get that. But one of the great things about um, the, the platform we're using here is an opportunity to hear from lots of different voices. And so again, if you are somebody uh, who works in education and is uh, a teacher in the UAE or in the region uh, or even globally uh, and you're, you're um, interested and, and would like to come and join us on the show one week, uh, then please do get in touch with myself uh, and or Ollie uh, and uh, we can start a conversation about how we can make that work. Also, um, you know, it, it is a live show and so because we're quite you know, a very small outfit, it's just myself and Ollie putting these things together working with our our professional learning network bringing in people that we know or people that are in the education space to come and share some of these things with us um, and the, the beauty of this is um you know we, we've got a chat window 
uh, on the side here on YouTube. So if you want to um, put any questions in, if you want to just do a little holler, like a, you know, a shout out from wherever you are in the world, um, or if you've got a recommendation around something or a question for the guests, all these sorts of things, please do, please do uh, drop us a, a little line in the chat in the live chat and we can not only respond to those things uh, but we can share those things on the screen as well and we're always very happy to uh, engage with our audience um we, ollie and i are, are two teachers and i hope you don't mind me saying this ollie but we're in this to help people and help make a difference and to support teachers uh, with with all aspects of teaching and learning uh, this show particularly is looking at sort of future technologies really with uh, although for many schools it's a current reality um but um, you know, we're talking about lots of things in the coming weeks. So we've got some uh, sessions lined up in the future, for example, about uh, preparing yourself to uh, move abroad. If, you look, if you're if you starting your sort of uh, venture into teaching internationally, uh, we've got some sessions lined up uh, exploring how to embed cognitive psychology principles into your everyday teaching and learning practice. Uh, we've got um, best use of social media as a teacher. We've got ideas uh, and some guests lined up who's going to be sharing about how you can uh, use social media as a, uh, as a marketing tool for your school uh, taking control of your own voice and your own message uh, out there publicly and how you can do that got loads of things lined up and so please do engage with us get in touch uh, you can follow me at ICT Evangelist. You can follow Ollie at O Lewis underscore coaching. Um, and we're, we're, we're on lots of different platforms. So you can find us very easily either through uh, Twitter, for example, or on uh, either of our blogs. Uh, so uh, please, please, please do get involved. That's what it's about, isn't it, Ollie? Getting people involved, sharing these things, isn't it? Yeah, it's all about connecting and collaborating, I think. And that was kind of what what basically drew us together to come up with Learn Live UAE, I think, and sharing best practice and, and voices across the educational space um, from, like you said, you know, with our lined up shows, marketing departments, schools and teachers on the ground actually teaching. So I'm really, really pleased uh, that we've actually started this up. And um, yeah, well, I think we're going to hit that magic hundred pretty soon. I think after this show, we're going to be there. So I'm going to make that prediction. Let's make it happen. Um, <laughs> I think let's get our first guest in, Mark, I think. Um, yeah, absolutely. Would you want, would like to do that so we don't like, bring him in and yeah, treat sure. the fuck out again at the same time? Certainly. So I'll introduce uh, Levent Erdogan. He is a uh, international teacher. He's also an Apple Distinguished Educator, creator, digital media specialist. He's a former editor in LA film industry, uh, producer of uh, YouTube content as well, hashtag music ed. Um, and participates quite heavily in Apple Edu chat. Um, Levent, welcome to the show. Thanks for staying up so late. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> That's a, how, how are you guys doing? Really good. How, how late is it with you right now? Uh, it's just past midnight, actually. Fair play. So listen, I mean, it's a, that's a huge commitment right there, just to stay up this late, just to come and talk to some guys about what you're doing, teaching and learning. Um, yeah. How are things for you in Hong Kong? You say you, you, uh, lockdown's been sort of reduced down, you're back in schools, is that right? Yeah, Hong Kong's going really well, actually. Um, the government's done a great job with, uh, with handling everything, and uh, everything's being eased off very slowly. Uh, this Wednesday, we're starting to get our grade 9 to 12 students back. And uh, teachers, have, at least at my school, we've been back for about a week now. And um, next week, we're going to get another group of kids. And then the following week, the last, the remainder of the kids. Uh, I worry it'll be a little bit rough for the kids, um, just because it's going to be kind of a hybrid schedule um, where uh, for the first half of the day, they're going to be in class face to face and, you know, not much break time, no food allowed. And then they're going to have to go home to online classes for the remainder of the day in the, in the second half. So, um, I mean, we'll, we'll see how it goes, I guess. I think that's the only thing you can do, really, to sort of play it by ear, because, you know, the yeah. variables can change so quickly, can't they, with the situation that we're in right now? It was funny, yeah, actually. Yeah, we don't. This is new, new territory for everybody, right? So, yeah, yeah, that's it. I remember one of your um, sort of pranky videos um, that uh, I saw uh, way back when. Now, um, uh, when, when the riots were happening, the schools were shut down a little bit, and I saw. Um, you, you, obviously, you know what I'm talking about. Do you want to share yeah. with the audience uh, what it is that you made, and uh, perhaps uh, yeah. point them in direction so where they can find that as well. So, okay, so I'm, I'm always exploring just like different ways to kind of ins uh, inspire my, my film study students and uh, my media students. And so um, when the, uh, the Hong Kong riots started happening, I, I came up with this idea of making this, um, 
this hologram teacher video um, just to, because all, all of our students were at home and I, and I made this video just saying that, you know, we're working on this new thing for you guys because my a lot of my students uh, are on my my uh, my Instagram as well. And I post a lot of my content on my Instagram as well, as well as my Twitter. So I made this video basically saying like, hey, we're working on this new tech for you guys. Uh, we're going to be we're going to be uh, making holograms um, so that, you know, when schools are closed, we could still you know, we could still teach you guys with holograms or something. I can't remember exactly what I said, but it was basically like hologram teachers. And uh, I got a number of people saying, you know, I knew holograms were, were around the corner one of these days. I, I knew I was going to live long enough to be able to see holograms. So uh, that was pretty fun. So le leading on from that as well, then. So you, you, um, you, you had some, some, uh, the story goes that you told me was uh, someone said you should think about doing something similar for an April Fool's prank as well. So uh, do you want to sort of talk us through a little bit about what it was that you did for April Fool's as well? Because that was just fantastic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the April Fool's prank was uh, was an AR thing, um, and I was, you know, before I came to the the idea of doing something for AR, I was thinking like, okay, what's like, how do we do a good a good prank? Like I, I was thinking like technically related prank. I was thinking, okay, what kind of tech is close but not quite here yet? What what do people want to believe in? What do people uh, see as being sort of around the corner almost? And I was thinking sort of AR wearables, and then I came to the conclusion that okay, maybe I could come up with this um, this AR contact lens idea. So I, uh, mm. I came up with this whole thing where I was I was pretending that uh, I was being a beta tester for um, an AR. Um, contact lens or a company that was producing an AR contact lens. I was kind of alluding to the fact that it was Apple. Uh, I didn't say anything about Apple. I didn't name Apple, obviously, but I was, I was hopefully hoping to, 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 to convince people that I was working with Apple because, you know, I, I think there were stories recently that Apple bought out um, an AR glasses company recently. So, yeah, there's been um, lots of stories I, about that sort of thing, haven't there? Yeah, so I was, I was almost alluding to the fact that I, I was working with Apple, and you know we're, we were working on this AR contact lens, and then I I switched to uh, I switched with the camera, so I turned it around uh, to to face me, and then I I um, superimposed this uh, really bright, colorful uh, contact lens effect over one of my eyes. So, and then when I turned the camera back around, um, and then I I uh, forgot what else. Uh, I I, sh I I pretend that I am actually um, showing that showing the view from the contact lens as if there's a con as, as if there's a camera built into the contact lens, and I go into a lot of detail about like the specs of the camera and like how it's supposed to be like 720p because it's brand new, but you know they're working towards building up to like 4k and all that sort of stuff. So I was really trying to like get into detail about selling it and all that sort of stuff. And um, and yeah, and so I, I ended up coming up with this idea of, of like filming it from my perspective and I put my hands in front of my face so you can see my hands and then I'm like moving my head around. And actually legitimately the way I was filming was that I had I had to film it with my iPad and I had this I had this stand originally and then I had to figure out a way to get my hands in the frame. I think I, at one point I was like holding it in my mouth or something and then like, so I didn't have a, a head strap or anything. So I was like holding it in my mouth while showing my hands. So anyways, it was a big production, but I don't know. I fooled a lot of people with that one too. So it was good. I have that actually lined up in some yeah. slides and I can show you guys that later. Oh, since we're talking, do, do, do you want to bring it up now and talk about it now or should we lead into that with some, because we, we, we're going to try and find out because obviously you do use augmented reality and, and some of the tools that are out there to support what you do with teaching and learning. But what I see you do a lot of, like you said, is you, you'll use the ideas behind these types of technologies um, because part of your work, I'm guessing, um, is to um, help learners learn how to uh, complete different sort of special effects type things in, in the various creations that they do within your subject. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So, like, when I'm teaching my film students, I, I'm always kind of looking for for new ideas, for ways to kind of inspire them with their projects, and uh, and like, obviously, I'm teaching middle school students, so they're always they're always really into like the special effects and like superpowers this and superpowers that and all these different things. Uh, so, you know, AR is one of those things where I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to find ways to incorporate AR in the media work that I do. Um, there's a couple of little things that I've done here and there. Um, it's still sort of new to me, but I, I've been looking, I've been finding some small things here and there to use it um, with my students and kind of show them different things. Um, they haven't 
you know, gotten into it as much as I have. Um, the, but, uh, but I think there's a lot of potential overall. So you have something there ready to sort of show us some, some examples of how you've been thinking about applying these things. In, in your yeah. Audience. Yeah. I just forgot how to share a screen on this thing. Oh, it's right there. Okay. Hold on. So I'm sharing screen. Uh, okay. Cool. Okay. All right. Can you see my slides? Yes, absolutely. Yep. Cool. Let me just uh, hit present on this thing. So these are just a bunch of like random ideas that I've kind of gone through. And uh, I ended up building my whole apartment in, in AR here in uh, Reality Composer. And I was thinking like, man, this would be an amazing like math lesson, right? Uh, just thinking about, you know, going through measurements and all that sort of stuff. And one of the things that's really intriguing to me is like building these worlds that you could kind of immerse yourself into. So like I built this um, in full scale, like full size. This is my tiny, tiny Hong Kong apartment. Uh, <laughs> and uh, no, I don't actually have these, these 80s movie posters. I just put them in for fun, but that is my actual view from my apartment. Uh, and then I kind of took it another step further and I was thinking like, what, I mean, what about like, what can you do about thinking about interior design? Like, that'd be cool. Like start, once you have your apartment or that your space built, you know, start tearing down some walls, checking, uh, checking out what it would look like if you're, uh, if you wanted to, you know, renovate your space or if you already have it built in AR. And then here are some other, oopsie. Oh, sorry. Um, and then, uh, down here is just some other ideas of like some 3D Lego stuff. Again, this is another kind of world that I that I made in in AR um, that I was just kind of like walking through. It was a life size. So imagine like walking through a life size Lego world, right? Um, that was that was pretty interesting to kind of build and put together. And here's the um, here is the, uh, the the hoax. So I could kind of <laughs> skip ahead here. So I ended up building this like a, a full mock app in um, in Keynote, and um, here's the part where you see my face and you see the lens, mm. and then like this is the part where I'm literally holding the camera in my teeth to make it seem like like it's like the lens has the camera built in, right? And yeah, that's amazing. How much planning and preparation actually went into that? I'm interested to know because, you know, you've obviously told us you've thought about it loads, but you had me hook, line, and sinker. I think I was straight on the phone to Mark to say, is this real? Like, can I actually buy one of these? Although I just <laughs> people in the, tw in the Twitter chat sort of saying, can I be a beta tester as well? But, I, yeah, I thought it was amazing. Yeah, um, I, I think as soon as I, I had the idea, I, I just had to think about, you know, how to execute it. I it took maybe a little while uh, to come up with, a, with with like a solid idea, but um, I think just the hardest part was just figuring out how to execute like what I wanted my my vision to be, like the the app, the like the fake app on my phone. If you look here, like when I show the phone, I, I end up tapping the screen. So I make I, I ended up making all of that and making it interactive. So. Um, and like I, it's it's pretend, like I'm pretending that it's loading, and I have some sound effects playing and stuff. And um, it's just uh, this part, of like building that, took some time, and like thinking about how to how to do all this sort of stuff. And um, I, I I don't know if it took that long, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it takes a little bit of time, but it's worth it. It's all it's all in good fun. What I really and like then, about uh, the examples you sorry, go ahead. No, no, no just while she's loading something up. What I really like about all your examples is they're all tangible. They're not, they're not kind of out there. They're all, you know, realistic things that, are, you know, within everybody's frame of reference, certainly from a, a kind of teaching point of view, they're all things that are common um, that people can associate with and resonate with. Um, yeah. Which I think is massively important because it gives some, that, it's that hook for students, isn't it? Um, into yeah. what you're doing and makes it, a lot more, a lot easier for them to associate with. Um, I mean, that's what it's about, right? The engagement, yeah. right? Like it, finding ways to engage students, right? And if you engage them, if you, if you find a way to engage them, they'll, they'll learn, they'll learn way more than what, uh, than, you know, from a textbook or something else that, that's kind of boring or, or stale. Yeah. In terms then of 
and, and kind of using AR, VR products in the classroom, what kind of cognitive psychology principles um, can you reinforce using these kind of technologies with the students? I mean, I'm not really a psychology expert, I, but I, like I like I mentioned, I, I think the the engagement and just just preparing them um, in uh, in in various ways to uh, to learn this sort of method or learn with this sort of method. Um, I mean, just think about the ways that um, students can learn by holding like a merge cube in their hand, right? For, with if they're learning about Mars or the Sun or something like that, right? In comparison to um in comparison to learning from a textbook so like going back to the engagement idea i think um that'll definitely increase their their uh, their learning value from all of their their experiences yeah sure. i think we'll add something onto that as well if that's uh, if that's right just to reinforce what van said as well as you know um you know, there were two things i'm going to share really there's that arthur c clark bit where you know uh, when technology is sufficiently advanced enough it's indistinguishable from magic and so we see a lot of this stuff and it's just like oh wow like you know my own children um talk about you know daddy can we do the magic you know when they've used uh things yeah. like the virtuality or the uh um, or, or the um, various um, AR cards with the quizzing on that uh, Rani's company do, all those sort of things. You know, they, they say, Daddy, can we do the magic? And it's, it, it's, it's such a great hook for them. But if you flip it around, thinking more about the sort of teaching and learning around all of it, there are two sort of key things I wanted to sort of focus on in, in support of what the event's saying there. The, the first one is around sort of concrete examples and the importance of having something which is really, and, and you yourself as, as a physicist, Ollie, a lot of the subject content you have to teach is is really intangible. It's, it's difficult to actually yeah. um, actually get an understanding or, or to grasp all those sort of things along because it, 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 they're, often, they're often at a, a, a subatomic particle levels and all this, I mean, again, you're the physicist, not me. Uh, I'm more like Penny across the hallway than than uh, <laughs> the, the, the guys in in the apartment across the hallway, but um, yeah, that that idea of being able to make these things far more tangible is really important. I think. And the flip side, if you think about things like SAMA, when we're thinking about your modification and redefinition levels there, and that's not to say there's anything wrong with substitution because you know they, we had the conversation just yesterday, didn't we, Ollie, about how substitution can can still be really helpful. But if we're using technology to do things that wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for the technology. And we wouldn't be able to do those sort of things. I remember you um, sharing back a little while ago, Ollie, about the Big Bang AR, for example. And I asked you, you know, what, what sort of AR stuff or VR stuff would be helpful to you in your subject? Well, you know, the ability to go in and view the Big Bang in, in VR space and to experience that, to make the things I'm trying to, which are, are quite intangible for students to understand, actually more tangible because they can see those things. Yeah. I think that's where these technologies can massively, massively help. And I often share, and there's so much ed tech that can be gimmicky, and and um, and and that's when teachers who are particularly um, focused on top evidence and research and informed practice, and there's nothing wrong with that at all, but it doesn't do ed tech any favors when people uh, or teachers are sharing um, products that are just you know being being done for engagement purposes and that's what i love about the events examples because it makes the intangible tangible it brings together all these different things which really support teaching and learning in his product in, in, in his um, um project and in, in his classroom and howell roberts often talks about uh, botheredness i mentioned botheredness in the um, um uh, other show the other night that i, that I do um on covid edu stories but actually getting students bothered about your subjects are hard but once you've got them bothered, they do become, you know, and really into your subject. And you know, this is both of you, I'm sure. But they, they become obsessed. They want to learn more, 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 more all the time. And part of that is engagement. And, and you know, Carl Hendrick often talks about uh, engagement being a poor prop for learning. And I, and I get that absolutely. Boy, oh boy, it is a, a fantastic byproduct of great teaching and learning where you're yeah. using things for really fantastic um, purposes that aren't gimmicky, I think. I don't know what you guys think yeah. about that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I got, I, got, I got a bit soapboxy there. Sorry, Ollie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You feel free to step back up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, looking at some of the things that the event has built there, and the students would probably go on to build in, you know, building Lego worlds or using Minecraft um, as an example. You know, it helps certainly helps their independence and develop some of those metacognitive skills where they start to build up a picture and understanding of their own learning process and they make appropriate task selections. Um, 
you know, and ask questions in line with their learning to help, you know, build that schema within their head. So I think there's also meta metacognitive strands within that as well. Once they get past that initial phase of, um, you know, using whatever XR technology they are, you know, immersing themselves in at the time. So I think it's really, really useful um, tool there um, to, to assist students in the classroom. Um, I've got a bit of a geeky question for you, Levent, if that's all right. Um, sure. I mentioned that Arthur C. Clarke Clark thing about technology being indistinguishable from magic. And often, I mean, as an ADE, you all have seen the Eclipse magic stuff, you know, where you can just like flip from, and, and you'll have done stuff for years with your uh, background, yeah. a, a quick transition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. So. Yep. Um, can you can you um, give us a few um, insights? And I, I know a, a true magician never gives away all their secrets. But can you give away some of the secrets to what it is you do? Um, some of the tools you use, perhaps some of the apps, uh, some of the things that you you have access to that, that other teachers might like to explore and find out more about. Uh, like AR related, you mean? Yeah, or just making some of these these fantastic resources that you're making. You know, I, I mean, I'm looking at those uh, modeling ones. I mean, I know you can do some great stuff in CoSpace, for example. I'm wondering if you use that as a tool for some of those things you've made, for example. Yeah, I mean, I've used CoSpaces a little bit, but not much lately. Um, I mean, what uh, what I was showing you with the with the apartment that I built, um, and also the uh, the Lego world. Uh, that was all reality composer basically and it takes a little it's a little finicky learning how to manage the files at first so just just learning how to deal with usdz files um the lego stuff that's all uh mechabricks.com files so you could download uh 3d files so once you kind of get your your head wrapped around understanding how the file system works for um for ar for the apple ar files which is usdz um and you learn how to kind of transfer the, the file type. I think when it comes out of mechabricks.com, it's like .obj, like the object file. And then yeah. um, there's reality uh, converter that you use to convert it all over. And then you, I mean, it's a little bit tricky at first. And so there's a little bit, bit of a barrier to entry into, into build, being able to build all that sort of stuff. But once you get past that, it's smooth sailing, and it's like you can just start throwing in all these USDZ files. And there's a number, a number of resources uh, that you can find online um, that have like free or Creative Commons USDZ files that are available to use in whatever your projects. Um, there's one that I have used before that I think is called USDZ Share. I think that's their tag on Twitter as well, USDZ Share. Um, I've chat with whoever's behind that account uh, from time to time. They seem pretty open to like you know questions and all that sort of stuff. And they're they're creating stuff and posting stuff fairly frequently for you to mm. use in your projects. Um, and uh, so yeah, Mecca Bricks is for all those all those Lego little tidbits. And then uh, USDZShare.com. Um, what else uh, for the all for the like the the hopes the April Fools thing? I, I built the app like the phone app i built that all in keynotes and like i i kind of mix a lot of different things together uh with final cut pro keynotes uh clips mm. all all sorts of like wherever i whatever tool works for the job you know what i mean that's uh, i i grab yeah. this and i just i just put it all together so whatever whatever works in that moment i'll, I'll just use that oh, cool that's a great approach to to this sort of thing as well isn't it it's one for the time i can see all these waving his which means you know, say no, I was going to say exactly that. I was going to say thanks for those tips, um, Levent. But I was going to say I'm mindful of the time. We should probably bring our next guest in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, it uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce um, uh, somebody who, um, if, if you're if you're somebody who is uh, uh, into their use of technology, uh, um, then he doesn't really need much introduction. Um, but um, I'd just like to welcome into the show this evening, uh, Mr. Steve Bambury. Um, I say I've I've known Steve for quite a few years now, and um, I mean we've we've met and worked together in places all over the world. We've been very lucky, um, not just in Dubai, um, um, but um, multi guests, uh, um, award winning educator. Um, he he um, not only gets to present and share his work around the world, uh, but he does so virtually in CPD and VR as well. Um, I mean, we, we, probably, we could probably spend the rest of the show just listening through your various accolades, to be honest, Steve. You've got more letters I've seen in, in HRH, but um, very welcome to the very welcome to the show, Steve. How are you doing in Dubai? 
I'm, I'm all right, man. You know, I was talking about you the other day because um, I was talking about the, the, the way that we, um, obviously we worked on the, the two periodic tables of AR and VR apps together. And I can't yeah. remember. I was on, I think maybe it was on Jeremy Williams' podcast, The Dismissed Show. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, might, it might be one of the other ones because I've, I've done a bunch recently. Um, but I was talking about the fact that you launched the first one on stage at Bet in 2018. And then at the end of the same week, I then did it inside VR. Um, yeah, it's been a while since I, I've gone back to those. I, I'm, I'm, I, I think we probably need to look at that one from 2018. It probably some of those apps don't exist anymore. Um, it's a really fast-paced moving um, sort of space, isn't it, Steve? One of the questions we wanted to ask you, actually, is where, where do you see sort of the use of XR, um, both in education and beyond, in, say, five years' time? So... You know, it's, it's funny you had that down to ask me because uh, uh, what I'm primarily in between working with schools at the moment, I'm, I'm writing my book, um, which will hopefully come out um, by Christmas. And the I'm not I decided not to write it chronologically. So I'm kind of jumping around and uh, writing chapters here and there from different sections. But there is uh, a, 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 the chapter I'm literally in the middle of writing is what's the future of VR in education? trying to do a bit of crystal ball gazing which as you say because because obviously technology moves forward so quickly it's it's almost a redundant task to sort of say where where will things be I mean, there's certain things though that are are all but guaranteed as you mentioned already mark like you know things will get faster things will get cheaper things will get smaller you know this is what always happens with with pretty much all forms of technology um I think as well, what you're going to see in terms of VR is you'll, you'll see that the death of controllers, you know, I've probably got controllers up, you know, they're actually on the top, but, um, like handheld controllers, uh, you're already seeing with, with, the, with the Oculus Quest and, and um, some of the other higher end headsets where, where they're integrated hand tracking, which is, is much more intuitive. Um, and really for me, the, the penny dropped with the, with the importance of hand tracking um, during uh, an episode of my Live from Dubai show uh, inside VR that I hosted, I think it was in January, and I had Suzanne Lee in, uh, who is someone based in Scotland who does a lot of work with um, patients with dementia. And she was talking about how she, she was so eager for the controllers to be done away with and move fully towards hand tracking because the biggest friction point for her was the fact that every day she would go back and have to reteach them how to access the content because they the, the patients had forgotten the uh the very what the various buttons did whereas if you were just using your own hands it, it was a lot more intuitive it made a lot more sense it was a lot more natural uh, mm -hmm. and to a degree i think the same the same can be said in terms of working with kids with uh vr technology you know that the the interface is such a shift away from your traditional computing interface of a keyboard and a mouse or a touchpad um, that it, it can be it can be a real friction point in terms of helping kids access um, virtual reality content successfully in terms of AR I mean what what most people within the immersive tech industry are expecting is a kind of um, convergence of AR and, and VR hardware so that your, you know your headset your, your wearable can do both so that you can access the, the augmented reality content in your day-to-day -day life, but then you can, you know, f tap a button and then you can jump into full virtual spaces using the same hardware. Um, beyond that, in terms of the next five years, I mean, there's the, the rumblings of Apple finally releasing a headset are getting to the point now where it, it's kind of hard to ignore. And, you know, they've just bought up um, Next VR as well. So it's clear that they've got, something in the works behind the, the closed doors in Cupertino. Um, so I, I would imagine that Apple enter the enter the fray. You're going to see Oculus and, and, and by obviously jumping up a level, you're going to see Facebook really push the, the multi-use of social VR with the launch of Project Horizon this year. Um, and the other big one that's imminent is, uh, which is I've just been kind of, I've just had the tape cut that I was allowed to uh, to tweet about yesterday is uh, on, on May 26th, this this month, next week, there's a product being launched in, in China um, by a company called XR Space, which I've seen running and is unlike anything 
else in the industry and it has potential to completely turn the industry on its head um completely different approach company founded by the um the former the, one of the original founders of htc who left to, to found this company and has been working for four years on this now um and and they're finally coming out of uh, into the into the spotlight next week and uh i think this is gonna um rattle some cages when people see what it does <laughs> Well, it's interesting hearing you talking about the um, the hand tracking and things, because it's those sort of things. Uh, and we see it in lots of different areas. We've talked recently just on Twitter chatting uh, about upload. Um, but I've seen you present, and we, we've talked about Ready Player One many times. I mentioned in a little bit earlier on, didn't I, about when science fiction becomes science fact. And it's, it's clear that when I, I, I do a fair amount of crystal ball gazing myself, uh, not literally, but you know, I get asked sort of those sorts of questions a fair bit too. And Actually, we can often look to science fiction to see where things are going to go because it gives us a great framework for how that might look, what it might feel like, and then how that sort of technology might be developed and things as well. Um, just going into uh, some more questions uh, from you, Steve. Yeah, we, we, we talked about the sort of cognitive um, science principles and what have you and, and, and how you can get sort of impacts or, or how it might be linked to all those things. But you work with lots of schools around um, the use of XR, um, be it AR or VR and what have you. Have you got any hallmarks of like, you know, what a good one looks like or some, some examples of some good teaching and learning practices uh, with some of the tools that are available to share with the audience at all? uh yeah i mean it, the, the best place in terms of finding examples from from the work that i've done both when i was at, uh, working at, obviously at jess for the last 11 years and then working with various schools uh, around the uae and and i've done some work with one of the big schools in saudi arabia recently as well using um virtual reality most of that stuff you can find on uh, like the uh, on my website on virtualityteach.com um in terms of sort of hallmarks and, and best practice um, yeah, I mean, it, it, as with all technology, Mark, and I know that this has been your mantra for a long time, it's always about putting the pedagogy first. It's always about focusing on making sure that, that, that um, any experience is, is learner-centric, learner you know, is focused on what's the, the point of the activity rather than just to get that wow factor. You know, it is easy, especially if, if kids don't have a lot of experience using stuff like VR to, to get what what we call VR face, you know, that kind of dropped your uh, photo for your Twitter feed, but there, there needs to be a bit more meat behind that that kind of dropped your moment. Um, I think looking at um, logistics, so as I mentioned, obviously at the, minute, at the minute I'm writing my book, I'm kind of following the, the Simon Sinek golden circle principle, you know, so doing like the, the why, the first section is all about the sort of the why VR and the theory behind the power of virtual reality, moving on to the logistics. And I think schools really do need to, to spend a good amount of time looking at logistics from headset choice and aligning headsets and different types of headsets with different ages of learners um, to looking at spaces that are used to looking at um, then diving into the, you know, the, the pedagogy of how you're going to harness um, what will probably be limited amounts of hardware. You know, we were kind of spoiled over the last decade with um, with this shift towards, um, you know, since the, the first iPad come out, this shift towards sort of the, the desire for things to be one to one. Um, but we are now in early days of, of the new, you know, the next step, the next evolution of computing and you know, schools aren't going to be able to go one to one with headsets. And even if they were, they probably wouldn't have the physical space to to get the most out of them. So you need to, you know, revert to different approaches in terms of how you harness the, the hardware, how you integrate it successfully, making sure that you don't end up with that old paradigm where you've got one kid having a go and then a queue, so, you know, where the kids are basically stood there wasting their time. So, you know, looking at the resources that you've got ac access to, looking at uh, in terms of hardware, looking at how you're going to apply them successfully, how you're going to apply them effectively and not waste anyone's time. Um, and then looking for the, the best types of content. And, you know, it's it's a different world when it comes to, particularly when it comes to the higher end, like, you know, the, the true um, VR, because unlike, you know, with an iPad, you want, if you're looking for an experience on an iPad, you go to the app store. Whereas if you've got, say, like a, a Vive or something, you know, I can get content from Viveport, but I can also get content from Steam. 
if I've got an Oculus, then I can get content from the Oculus Store, but I can also get it from Steam. Even if I've got an Oculus Quest right now, I can download stuff from the Oculus Store, but then there's a lot of great content being put out inside Quest that you can sideload on. And being able to, to find the content right now, um, I think is, is proving um, a little, not impossible, but it's, it's proving difficult, I think, for, for some schools to, to kind of navigate the various platforms where they can access content from. You know, I did read Steve. Sorry, Ollie. I did read Steve, and, and um, forgive me for not being able to reference this correctly, but I, know, I knew you were the person who shared this. One of the things that was missing at the start of the iPad rollout stuff was MDM, mobile device management, in order to make it more easy to actually manage the devices and things. Yeah. And I, I'm sure I saw recently you shared something around uh, some sort of equivalent of MDM for VR. Yeah. Share a bit of, a bit of that for a second. Yeah, brilliant tool. Um, um, unfortunately, I literally. Um, I was shown this by, by the CEO of that company. It's called Grove Learning. Um, it works with Oculus Quest and Oculus Goes. Uh, and unfortunately, I was shown it maybe, what, four weeks before the schools closed. And once the schools closed, um, the you know, I had to kind of put a pin in that. I, I had half an article written for my website about it. We were looking to, to wrap it into the, the VR labs that I was helping uh, the school in Saudi Arabia to set up. But all of these things kind of, as I say, I've had to have a pinpoint in. But yeah, Grove Learning, fantastic platform. Uh, very much mirrors the, uh, you know, the, the Apple Classroom approach. Um, you can remotely open apps on every device that's, that's um, being controlled. You can pause apps. You can send messages to the screens. Um, you can limit the access to other content. You can stop students coming out of an app and going elsewhere. So um, I think... As you said, Mark, like, like I've, I've talked in the past as well about, you know, how <laughs> how lucky people are now when they're using iPads and they've got Apple Classroom and they've got MDMs, you know. And I remember in 2011 having been there with, you know, the likes of Luke, Reese, obviously, who you know, Mark and, and Ollie, I'm sure you know as well, like with tables full of iPads manually going around and installing apps on every single one. Um, you know, so having this tool available now for, for VR hardware is, is, is really good because more so than with the iPads, there's this, again, this friction point of this, it, it, it's such a monumental shift in terms of how you're interacting with technology that it, it scares people, you know, people are scared of the unknown and this is not just a small computer that you use your finger on rather than a, a keyboard. This is a completely new way to access digital media. So having something that can put a bit more control back in the hands of the educators is, is yeah, it's really important. Um, another shout out I would say would be to um, the guys at um, Springboard VR, uh, Josh and Jay over in LA, they, they, they run uh, a platform called Springboard VR, which has also launched um, an educational platform. So they curate uh, educational content all into one place so that you can kind of Kind of like a Netflix approach to to the educational content, so they they kind of bringing it together from the various stores, so that you've got it all in one place, uh, like categorized in much tidier ways by subject. Because in those uh, stores, you know, in the Steam store, in the even in the Vive Port store or Oculus store, you can only sort of search kind of by education. You can't search by history or science. Um, so yeah, it's it's nice to see that there's already companies that are, are thinking about that and thinking about how to yeah. reduce the friction for uh, for schools trying to integrate the hardware. Hmm. Oh, thanks, Steve. Ollie, do you want to come in for that? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, Steve, you mentioned a few sort of strands there that relate to accessibility. You mentioned kind of accessibility of the devices within schools in terms of their, how they work. You mentioned accessibility in terms of having adequate spaces in the schools as well as um, accessibility in terms of, of the cost of the devices themselves as well. Um, at what point do you see, you know, obviously Apple coming to the table is, is probably a good thing in the grand scheme of things because it will drive the other competition and um, like with all technologies, it will drive prices down. Um, so I've kind of got a twofold question for you really, which is um, how do you see that return of investment um, increasing in the near future in terms of learning and then um, how how does XR, whether it's AR or VR, enhance critical retention within students? I mean, in, in terms of return on investment, um, it, it's it's a very hard thing to explain 
without but because, because the because the nature of it, especially when you're talking about vr you know it's experiential technology if you don't if you haven't tried it you can't understand it um you, you can literally be stood next to somebody that's walking the virtual plank and laughing your head off at them uh, because you think it's ridiculous but it isn't until you put that headset on yourself that you can truly understand the the emotive visceral response that you have to to that kind of experience and, and to being inside a fully immersive uh virtual space you know when you when you have that sense of of, of presence as it's called um and you know the, the the real world around you is lost um so to 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 truly gauge the, the return on investment you you need to to make sure that your your school's leadership team have uh, are not just being pitched something that is um alien to them you know that you, you one of the first first one of the very first people when i was working at jess and really trying to push with it with the original hcc vibe was one of the first people i put inside that headset was was mark steed the, the former director so that he right from the back he knew what i was talking about firsthand um but i mean the the the, the potential for for the for the for the technology is, is unparalleled you know it, it, there's there's nothing else like it there's there's no other form of of media there's no other um technology out there that can create that same level of, of, of emotional response that you get from a, a, a virtual reality um application in terms of costs you're already seeing them tumble you know the the the, the oculus quest is a couple of hundred dollars and in the last week they've pushed an update through so now the cable that comes with it to charge it in the box can be used to plug it into a pc and run higher end vr apps um, essentially killing off th their own higher end headset the, the oculus rift s in the process um but you know that this is this is where we're heading we're heading towards um mass adoption we're heading towards headsets being a couple of hundred dollars accessible to everyone with a kind of unified platform um in terms of what sorry ollie what was the, uh, the other part of your question it was about um retention, retention. retention. yeah okay so I've got slides for this one. Hang on, let me share screen. <clears throat> a friendly heads up. Okay. I got a friendly heads up. Share audio. Yeah, it can do. Share. Is that all good? Oh, I brought a running in by mistake then. Uh, where have we gone? There we go. There. We all good? You seeing my slides? Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. Right. Um, so this particular set of slides, I'll show you about five slides. Okay, from a it's from a presentation that I delivered uh, for the I think the last time I delivered this was for the G20 summit in Saudi uh, in December. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm we're at three uh, minutes, Steve. Sorry. Again, I mean, to be, after give about three minutes, we need to bring our Rani in as well. So we've got about three yeah, minutes. No worries, please, sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll hurtle through these. So. Um, so when I first started talking about VR in education in 2017, you know, the, the kind of go-to line was that the, the jury's out in terms of data because there hadn't been a lot of studies, but there are now, there's, there is data. And what, what you'll see here is I've got um, data from different universities from around the world that, you know, you can put these puzzle pieces together and it really does tell a story. So this first one here shows a study that was uh, completed by Cornell University in the States where uh, VR, 2D content and a practical activity were carried out and it was found that nearly 80% of the students preferred the VR experience. Fair enough, okay, makes sense. It's new, it's shiny. We, we probably would expect that, okay? So then we look at the second one. This is from Warwick, obviously in the UK. Warwick did a study where they had students accessing content in VR through video or through textbook. And they found that the um, emotional response from the VR uh, learning method was much higher and also the students performed better, which, you know, that kind of makes sense. If they're emotionally engaged, if they're enjoying it, then um, the um, uh, the uh, retention rate, the, the, uh, the attention to the information is going to be higher. So then Saga University in Japan actually did um, a more comprehensive study where they looked at uh, EEG rates uh, and they, they were looking at um, concentration levels when students were engaged with VR content and they found that VR improved students concentration levels which again if you put the pieces of this puzzle together from the data that Warwick had showed you know like the students were they were um, more engaged and therefore obviously that their concentration levels have gone up. Beijing University 
their study showed that uh, students' retention of learning uh, was significantly higher. You can see from the numbers there, significantly higher when they were using VR as the medium, which again, following the puzzle here, Saga University in Japan studies showing that the concentration levels have gone up. Beijing University's data has shown that there was a higher retention of learning, which makes sense because if your concentration levels have gone up, you're going to retain the information for much longer. Um, and then this was the most recent um, data that was shared with me. Thank you to uh, Alvin Graylin from, from HTC for sharing this to me in, I think it was December. So this was uh, a Beijing Foreign Studies University carried out a, a study looking at language learning. Uh, and their results showed that the, the use of VR not only improved the results by up to double, but it raised student confidence levels by up to 10 times to actually go and to apply what they had learned, to apply their new language skills, which again, going back through those steps in the puzzle, it, it, that makes sense. If your uh, engagement level is up, if your concentration level is therefore up, you're retaining the information, and because you're retaining the information, your confidence level in applying what you've learned is always gonna be that much higher. I'm gonna stop sharing right there, guys. Hopefully I didn't go too long for you. No, that's, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. Uh, should we bring in uh, Arani now to bring in uh, her perspectives as well, Ali? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. So, uh, I'll introduce Arani, the CEO, co founder of um, Augmentify It and Peapod City. Hello. Um, works with Amazing STEM, is a STEM ambassador, BBC alumni, um, and all round STEMinist. <laughs> <laughs> That what you call me. Can I first say thank you? This sounds great. I, I kind of love listening to what you guys all, all do. Um, it's irony, by the way. Not irony. Yeah. Irony. My apologies. Ironies. Apologies. <laughs> right. um, so, you, so I'm not the developer in this. It's my co founder, who's CTO, Brett, who's based in Chicago, and I'm based in London. And, but my background, yeah, um, I studied science at university and um, I then went to the BBC and I went to the BBC Science Department and I've been in media. I'm a TV producer by trade. And um, I have a daughter who was obsessed with the iPad and we kind of saw that, we saw AR and VR coming out. And so the reason we kind of started developing AR and VR is because I actually went back to media to talk to them about doing AR and VR, and BBC is notoriously a little bit slow. So we decided, well, we can see children are engaged. What happens if we can teach science with AR and VR? We're going to go and have to develop this ourselves because the media is not going to touch it for a few years. So that was a few years ago. So we launched this journey. I think you know, we launched our first product in 2017, um, which is Augmented by it. And we do um, augmented reality cards, which are packed with loads of bats and have quizzes inside them. And um, I'm just looking at the questions that you, you sent me and it was kind of what value have the schools seen using, using mm. our products? Mm -hmm. And also, kind of, have I got any ideas of anything else I'd like to see in the space? Yes, I do. Um, the feedback we've got from teachers very much kind of mirrors what Steve, Steve was saying as well. It's teachers are saying things like there's increased engagement, of course. What we're interested in is increased engagement in science and STEM learning. Or we, we, we go for STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts and maths. Um, the arts primarily because I came from a creative, creative background. Um, but increasing engagement isn't just what you want. We know that it's going to be um, a wow factor. So um, teachers have been telling us they've watched their classrooms come alive for what otherwise would be boring topics. Um, we've done things like space, ocean animals, elements of the periodic table. They're currently working on another elements pack by by teacher demand, actually, and dinosaurs. Um, so we've covered areas, it's something that Mark was saying, we've covered areas that um, you can't normally get inside a classroom. So we've wanted to take students and teachers kind of to space and to the ocean and to see the animals underwater, to the past, to dinosaurs. 
to things that we can't actually see. We, we're all made of elements, and but we don't appreciate appreciate that. So we've kind of chosen these topics. I've got my cards and stuff here. I don't know if anyone's um, um, seen them before because we think that because science is something I've grown up loving science i used to watch science on tv all the time that's why i've ended up in science and in science television but um a lot of students think it's not for them and so my work as a stem ambassador i've been going into schools and seeing that kids were struggling a little bit with science their engagement with science so we decided to do ar around that i mean i've had teachers saying to me that their students are still talking about their lessons in the playground after using, after engaging with AR in the classroom, which is amazing to me. I want kids to talk about science, if anything, to be aware of what's, what's there so they can make decisions in the future, not because they, they should go off and be scientists, but they need to appreciate that our future is making kids future ready. Our future is primarily going to innovate through technology, through science. And so um, the, the schools kind of generally have, have enjoyed using the products we've used because they're, we're, we've made them affordable. As a mother, I wanted to make them affordable to other parents. We've won the best science toy, STEM toy, year after year after year, the Gold Awards, um, because we've offered something that nobody else Nobody else probably has. Um, other, other examples that I've seen in schools that I really like, I mean, we focus a lot on science. Um, English, um, Carter's Yard Phonics, um, if anyone's used those, those are really good for primary or elementary age. Um, the Quiver app is really good. Um, Colouring and bringing that to life for um, primary age is getting them engaged. Um, human body, Curoscope. Obviously, Ed's a friend of mine. I love the Curoscope, looking inside the body with the T-shirts, very simple. They've also recently come out with some space posters as well. The yeah. Merge Cube is really good as well. Merge approached us quite early on, actually. I think it was we were launching at a very similar time and we were at the same, I think we were at the Chicago Toy and Game Fair at the same time. And they approached kind of us back then. Um, we haven't done anything yet, but it doesn't mean we went. Um, in the VR space, now we did something at University College London, um, the Educate program, which teaches you the research skills, like researching how good your AR and VR products are in the classroom, how good your ed tech is in the classroom. And we came across another company called Musemio. A museo use kind of like a Google Cardboard, which is affordable for classrooms, and they take you into, into the past, into Egypt, into kind of his, history, really easy to access for, for schools and teachers. And the other VR, um, which um, we know as well, is Class VR by Avantis, which seems to have been taken up quite a lot over here, you always see them at the Bet Show. They're very much hunting forward with what, what they're doing, but they've also touched with AR as well. Um, I'm just having a look. I'm just going through the points that you wanted me <laughs> to look at. Um, what else did we do? We've actually, we're partners now as well with Prince World Records, which we can now announce properly. Um, we were approached, we launched our space cards in July 2017 or June 2017 and Guinness World Records approached us at the New Scientist Live exhibition in September that year and they said, we love what you do, we'd like to do some work with you. It was just literally like that and we said, why? Why would the Guinness World Records want to do some work with us? And they actually said to us, listen, we do the annual, we're known for the annual, but we're interested in the educational space as well. And we know, and I know now from going into schools, a lot of the schools have Guinness World Records in their libraries or in their classrooms. I've seen um, display boards, posters up in school corridors as well here, which very much is geared around 
TWR. So we initially did something with them, which was um, the Wild Things book. It was kind of a, it was a test run with something, which was one of their um, smaller books, not the annual. And we did some creepy crawlies, mini beasts, because we know that's kind of there in the curriculum. And um, that went, that went really well. And it went so well that the thing they'd originally approached us about, which was space, is what we're doing this year for the annual. So they only really announced that a few weeks ago. Um, so we are, have augmented the solar system for their book, which will come out in um, September, October. We'll do some more things around schools to give them some activities around there. But right now on the Guinness site, they have put out a free activity by us with an earth and an earth core that they wanted to do. They wanted to do some facts around the earth course. So they asked for that. So we've done that. Um, and we do, if kind of, if anyone wants to try out a bit of Auckland Fight for free for teachers, we did the first ever primary AI activity for the British Science Association. Um, and that was, that was a couple of years ago. So if you have a look at the primary activities for British Science Week, 2018, you'll be able to see an augmented reality mini beasts, which teachers can use, and a lot of teachers did use. I think the primary activity packs for that year, um, not saying they were all augmented by it, not all of them engaged with augmented by it, but I think about 45,000 um, schools, teachers downloaded the primary, primary activity. So I think kind of we do AR that is really accessible, but mainly for primary. Um, hmm. how, how do you move away from the wow factor of AR and VR for meaningful learning experiences? Well, you know, like Steve was saying, you know, I, my background, I did a master's in neuroscience. So I've always been about how does the brain learn? Um, how are we going to make this now more engaging? So we wanted to kind of gamify learning science. So that's something that I think kind of the education profession can learn from other professions that are using XR, they can look at gaming and see kind of what's what's done. Like Levant said um, about using um, things like the the creating your own AR experiences, but using things like Lego. Like teachers now, kind of they use everyone can create the whole Apple thing, and um, using stop motion. There is a way to look at things that are done in media, things that are done um, in the gaming world, things that are done in publishing to bring kind of a little bit more kind of, I suppose more variety to the way you use AR and VR. I mean, teachers, I think the key thing with AR and VR is that the teachers need to be trained up properly to know how to use it. It can't be a gimmick. It can't be, oh, look at these fun cards, they come alive. Now what? And we need to look at what the next step is to create a meaningful learning experience. And I think um, we have loads of facts on the backs of our cards. They're like mini interactive encyclopedias and packs of cards. So the teachers, they say they sometimes put the cards out on the trail or they give each student a card and they might go off and do a little mini project on it and then do a show and tell at the end of the class. So they're sharing with the other kids what they've learned the whole ar and vr is to just start the topic off it's sometimes something that's put up like dropped onto the the whiteboard on the front at the beginning on the on the apple the apple screens and just say today we're going to talk about calcium or whatever we're going to talk about these elements in the periodic table let's have a look at it oh wow that's amazing i mean i've lost i have lost count of the number of teachers that have said the periodic table is one of the most boring things to teach um, in, in class, no offense to any chemistry teachers, but it is. So we, um, they keep asking us for the whole periodic table, but this is, this is not probably something that we're going to achieve, but we'll get, we'll do quite a lot of them. Um, um, I'm trying to think what else can 
I'm just going to jump in for a second, Dorani, if that's all right. So one of the things that I really like about the, the cards as well, because I've, I've, I've known you for quite a long time now, um, but it was, it was not only the fact that, you you know, you could engage, you could see things that you would you would be possible to see without the use of the technology, but it was also the sort of quizzing stuff that was built in as well. Um, but I'm just to um, uh, apologise up front because I'm just mindful of the time that we've gone past our sort of closure time. We've had a message from somebody saying thank you for the episode already. Um, but I wanted to sort of, um, bring in um, Levent and Steve as, as alongside yourself for a second, Arani. We've had a question from somebody called Michael Pink, and uh, I wondered if you could just um, give your cash your eyes over that question for a second. He said, uh, is there not a danger between students who go into institutions that have and uh, those that have not? Um, Levent, have you got have you got any thoughts on on uh, Michael's uh, question? I think you got your microphone muted. For yeah. Uh, there you go. Hey, can you hear me? Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, definitely the that's the the barrier of entry to um, to being able to to access this type of technology, right? Some of it is very expensive. Some of it. Um, is not accessible to a large audience. Um, uh, what uh, Ron is talking about is the the cards seem very accessible and uh, very easy for students to to start using. So, I mean, I think iPads, like what Steve was talking about, how how all the prices are coming down with iPads getting cheaper and everything. Uh, things like what the those AR cards and everything, um, it just makes it more and more accessible. I think. Brilliant, thank you. I, I'd be minded to agree as well. Steve, what, what are your thoughts? I, mean, I, I guess you're kind of along, along the same sort of line of thinking as uh, Levent there. Yeah, I mean, and, and you're, kind of, you're kind of seeing that right now. I've I, I referred to what's going on right now, obviously, with the school closures and, and the pandemic um, in, in terms of VR's place it, it, as being a, a back to the future moment. You know, like I think if, if we were 10 years in the future, nobody would be talking about Skype and Zoom. Everyone would you know there's a lot higher probability that everyone would be conducting all of the these remote sessions inside fully virtual spaces and, and i think that that right now you're, you're seeing schools that even schools that did in, invest in the hardware is is sitting kind of in a box in a cupboard while the schools are closed you know there, there is an equitable access right now we aren't at that ready player one point where everybody's got a headset at their home mm -hmm. so even with the best will in the world it's very hard right now for, for schools to be harnessing the um, immersive technology remotely. You know, it's not impossible. And again, I've, I've, I've written stuff around how, how you might do that. But um, with, without getting to that point where everybody has got equitable access to, to a headset, you are more reliant on the school having access to the hardware. Um, and, and as such, you come back to having to adapt your pedagogy to, to to deal with the fact that you you can't necessarily be one to one in the same way that you might have been for, for the last few years with 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 tablets or with Chromebooks or something similar like that. Mm. It is, it's, it's big in lots of different ways. I mean, there's digital divide. Is it, is, is it about access at home? Is it about access in school? That was one of the beautiful things, I think, about what Apple did with AR kits. You know, just invested heavily in it and then made it completely embedded within the whole iOS ecosystem. So regardless of whether you're using the phone in your pocket or an iPad device, you know, you can still get access to that great AR content, which I think was a real, you know, a real nice move in that direction. What, what, what are your thoughts on the sort of access stuff in this, within this question, Arani? Um, well, from my experience of going into schools, actually, um, my own daughter's school, we didn't have any tech at all. And I was constantly going to Apple schools and other schools that were kitted out with technology. And we ended up having a change of head teacher, actually. So I sat down and I told her about what I'd seen in the other schools. And she said, mm -hmm. right, we're going to raise some money and we're going to create a tech hub. And we're then... Within a few months, I think it was by February, I sat down with her in September. And by February, we were totally put it out with um, iPads, tech, different tech, kind of went to bed, picked up as much tech as possible. And the kids, there's been such a change in the classrooms, actually. So I think there is, there is a danger um, that those that don't have it, they don't, those that do have it, 
they they definitely engage with their lessons a lot better. I do I do see that. I kind of my if I had a dream, if I had a wish, every school would be able to have a tech hub. I think that's really important at this stage, this far into the twenty first century. Hmm. I think that's a great point to kind of bring our discussion to a close. Kind of the, our three guests have mentioned the importance of awareness, accessibility, the opportunity to be creative, teachers being confident and comfortable pedagogically with using the various products within the classroom that you know, make the intangible and abstract more tangible um, and real in their sort of learning experience. Um, so thanks everybody. It's been a really, really rich conversation tonight, listening to three different perspectives um, within the, the XR education space. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Thanks very much indeed, everybody. Uh, we'll put into the show notes links to where you can find uh, the event and Arani and Steve's different uh, blogs and Twitter handles and uh, YouTube channels and all the rest of it. But uh, for now, uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us this evening. And uh, please share about this uh, with your colleagues, ping an email around, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button uh, down in the corner. We need that magic hundred. Uh, we, need, <laughs> we need that magic hundred. So thank you so much, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for our guests, and uh, thank you very much. See you soon next week next week yeah